So lately I've been talking a lot about a product I call the TRAP, which is the Transient Reducing Auxiliary Plug. All right, and I invite you to check out a previous video that talks about how that works. And one question I got from people was, well, how do you know that the TRAP would actually survive the E1 of an EMP? The E1 of an EMP obviously has very high fields that it generates. How do you know that it's sized properly? All right, so I wanted to address that in this short video. A place to start might be by first talking about what the E1 would generate at the surface. And a well-established number that a lot of people use is that it could generate fields as high as 50,000 volts per meter. Now you can argue over whether that number's right or not. It doesn't matter much for our calculations. If you take that 50,000 volts per meter and you go through some calculations, what you find is that the power that corresponds to that is on the order of 6.6 .6 megawatts per square meter. Now that's a lot of power. All right, but what we really want to know is how much energy that is. All right, we want to turn that into joules of energy. So energy is just simply power times time. All right, now the time is the pulse width of the E1. If we just looked at the E1 pulse and we assume maybe 17 nanoseconds, that's a reasonable number. You assume that for the time here. The power is this 6.6 .6 megawatts per square meter. Multiply those two, two guys together and you get that it's 0.11 joules per square meter. Now, 0.11 joules per square meter doesn't sound like a lot, but again, the reason this is so damaging is that it's been compressed in time to only 17 nanoseconds. So the energy is not that much, but it's so small in time that that energy has to be essentially absorbed or dissipated that it ends up being extremely destructive, all right? And that's, you know, we have 50,000 volts per meter, that's going to cause a lot of damage to electronics. So the next thing to ask is, well, what is the square meters? How many square meters are we talking about? Well, in any given cable assembly in a car, we could draw it out if we wanted, and as if the wires went one way and then returned on a different path, you might find that maybe it was around one square meter of loop area, all right, uh, you know, a square meter, okay? Now, you can argue whether it should be two square meters or whatever you want, but just for our simplicity, for our numbers, let's call it one square meter. Now, some will be much, much smaller than that because the wires and the returns run right together, but we're just assuming sort of a, a wide loop, a current that travels in a wide loop, all right? So one square meter, if we put one square meter here and we multiply it together, we get that the maximum energy that you'd expect to see from an E1 in that one square meter loop is about 0.11 joules, all right? Again, very brief period of time, that's why it's so destructive. So we wanna make sure that we have a protective device that can take that amount of energy without being destroyed, all right? So what I did is I looked for a transient suppression device that would handle that power, and they always rate them in terms of watts instead of joules. So they usually use this one millisecond pulse and they tell you the amount of wattage, all right? So again, if you take the, the pulse width times the wattage, you'll end up getting those two uh, multiplied together, you'll get five joules, all right? So for the part that I selected, it would, it would survive about five joules of energy. Now this is very simplified, it's just for one case with a particular pulse width um, that you get this 5,000 watts. It's different depending on what the pulse width is, but for our numbers, it's a, it gives us a reasonable first guess that it would survive about five joules of energy. Now, if you compare five joules of energy to the 0.11 joules that's required, you could easily conclude, yeah, that, that part is very unlikely to be burned up by the energy that comes in from the E1. Now, that's very important. The problem is that it doesn't tell the whole story. The other thing that you have to think about is the protective device has to turn on very early in the pulse. If the protective device doesn't turn on for 20 nanoseconds, the pulse has already occurred and the damage has already occurred to the vehicle, right? So it has to turn on very early in this E1 pulse before the levels have gotten too high. Now, fortunately, the part that I selected for the trap products turns on in less than one picosecond. That means it turns on way early in this, way before the field levels get high enough and the voltage levels get high enough to cause damage. So it not only takes the energy that's required, probably more importantly, it turns on fast enough to allow it to absorb that energy, all right? So that's how I selected the component inside the trap, and that's why I believe it would be effective not only for an EMP, like the E1 event of an EMP, but also many other transients. Again, remember, this was rated for a one millisecond pulse, and those are much more common, like in, you know, in your vehicle when normal transients are kicking around. So it will not only handle very fast transients, but it will also handle much slower transients, all right? So I know this was a little bit technical, and there's some calculations and stuff on the board here, and there are certainly some assumptions being made here. But what I'm trying to do is give you a feel for the sort of the engineering thinking that went into the devices that were selected uh, for the TRAP product and why I believe it does a good job of protecting even from very high frequency events like an EMP. Now, as always, if you have questions, feel free to post them below or just send them to me an email and I'll do my best to answer them.